Welcome to From Startup to Grown Up, the podcast. My name is Alyssa Cohn. I'm an executive coach, an angel investor, and the author of From Startup to Grown Up. Each week, I talk to founders, creators, advisors, investors, and builders of all kinds about their insights and experiences in going from startup to grown up. This is episode 23. And what an incredible one it is. Today, I am talking to one of the greats, Scott Belsky. Scott co-founded Behance, which is an online platform to showcase and discover creative work. Scott was the CEO from Behance's founding in 2006 until Adobe acquired it in 2012. In addition to being an entrepreneur, Scott is an author, an investor, and a self-identified product obsessive. He's currently Adobe's chief product officer and executive vice president of Creative Cloud. In addition to knowing firsthand what it's like to go from startup to grown up, Scott has mentored, advised, and invested in many entrepreneurs, so he's a ton of experience guiding others. He also wrote an incredible book, The Messy Middle. Everyone should read this. It was incredibly inspiring to me when I was writing my own book, From Startup to Grown Up. This discussion is filled with nuggets of gold. Scott talks about how he knows he can trust an executive, why he sees culture as an immune system, and why it's important to extinguish most new ideas. He talks about how he's grown as a leader through stress and strain. So those of you going through stress and strain, please know that you're growing as a leader. And how he does retros on his leadership after he makes mistakes. We talk about the pushback he got when he brought in the first COO of Behance and how he got his team through it. And listen up, we talk about the secret to motivating people. This episode is filled with a ton of super practical advice for founders and all leaders. So grab a notebook And please enjoy this incredible discussion with Scott Belsky. Scott, welcome to the show. I'm so happy to have you today. Good to be here. Um, You know, I wanted to start, you know, you're well known as a designer, of course, and, you know, sort of who loves products. And I'm so curious about if you think about yourself as a CEO, when you're a founder and a CEO, how building your skills as a CEO is like building a product. Yeah, no, it's a good question. You know, I I feel like product is one of the most human disciplines. You know, you're ultimately building an experience for people taking into account their natural human tendencies, their desire to look great, you know, to do more in less time. There are, you know, frankly, like a degree of laziness when we're first doing something for the first time. And, you know, we don't have time to read tours and go on to go in crazy onboardings of products. We don't want to endure learning curves for things we don't even know we want yet. You know, it really, really, it's an empathy driven discipline, um, designing products for people. And ultimately, the better you understand people, the better those products will perform. I think leadership is quite similar. You know, when you're ultimately building an organization, you're doing so based on the desires and your understanding of the tendencies of people. And, uh, you know, pragmatically, like, what are they worried about? What are they insecure about? Why are they here? What chips on the shoulder, you know, drove them to take this risk in their lives and their career? And, you know, understanding the, the makeup of, uh, of the organization it's very similar in some ways to your point uh, to building a product. Yeah, I you know I love the way you put that, and I, I heard you say on another podcast that you know leadership or, or management is not scalable because at the end of the day you're really working one on one with that person trying to unlock who they are. Well, yeah, I think that I always like to say to entrepreneurs, I think that the best new products are remarkably unscalable in the beginning because you're trying to get a really tight conduit to the people and to the what they're feeling and how they're going through it and. You know, the best way of doing that is to not try to automate and scale everything from the onset, but to you know, really be in touch with the customer so you can understand, you know, the, the, the pulse of how they're how they're dealing with the product and what's working and what's not. Um, and yeah, I, 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 one of the joys of building a company is, you know, you go through every stage. And when we were probably up to our first, I don't know, 50 to 100 people in the team, um, we uh, you knew everyone's name. You could actually kind of control and feel the immune system always you know you knew when the team had a cold so to speak and you knew when to have an intervention and then at some point it just gets out of your hands and you know now overseeing an organization of thousands of people you know there's no way i can handle or know every day who's insecure about their career who's on their way out who's on their way in like 
And I, you know, you have to find new ways of doing it. And it ultimately relies on other people. And it's hard to make that transition from being self-reliant, which you have to be as an entrepreneur, and wanting to sort of control every aspect of the of the closed system of building something, which is really a helpful thing to do until it's not. And actually, just just to key off of that, how do you make that leap? What advice do you have for founders? And what advice do you give to founders about making that leap kind of from the first 50 to 100, where they're hands on to the point where they're managing thousands of people where they cannot be hands on anymore? Like, how do you what what's the best piece of advice you have for them to do that? Well, I think you look at you look at all of the leaders on your team that are overseeing the various functions or products. And you have to believe that each one is someone you can really trust, someone you can trust to represent you, someone whose judgment you trust. Um, you know, you start to feel like they don't need you, and that's a good sign. When you feel the opposite, when you feel like you have to validate everything and you don't want to actually introduce them to the customer because you're a little embarrassed and you don't want them to meet that new employee you really want to hire because you don't think they'll sell them well. And, you know, you got to like tune into those instincts and say, all right, this person is not going to be successful here. And you have to, you know, part ways for their benefit and for your benefit. But it's it's ultimately about at scale. It's about, you know, finding and sufficiently empowering and being able to trust people. And I, you know, that's one thing I've learned maybe the hard way because, you know, you jump in, you think you can fix everything. And um, that's not, it doesn't work that way, especially as you get scale. It's more about finding the right people and then knowing what questions to ask and what gates to set to like ensure that they're the right people. Yeah. And what trust looks like. I I was just having a conversation today with the CEO and the idea that, you know, part of the goal of the executive or part of the, his expectations for the executive team is that they build trust all around them, including with him. And that was like a concept for him, a new concept for him, I would say, but that's really what you're talking about, that you have to really trust the people who are empowered to act for you. That's right. That's right. And, and, and you have to give them the time and go through the motions to be able to build that trust. Right. So, you know, for me, it's strategy sessions and offsites and building a strategy together and having that leader lead the meetings with the people that are and, and see them, see him or her drive alignment. And really, you, know, you start to get a feeling after a series of these meetings, okay, this is in good hands. I'm going to now focus on something that's not in such good hands um, <laughs> versus, oh, I, this is not going to, you know, I need to micromanage this. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Now, I want to touch on something that you already referred to, the idea of the immune system. I, I love, I just heard recently you talk about that. Talk about co- when you say culture is an immune system or, you know, when the team has a cold, what do you mean by that? And what can CEOs take away from that? Yeah, well, the, uh, you know, a, a really well-oiled organization rejects anything that's new by design. And that's helpful. You know, the way to keep focused is to extinguish new ideas most often quickly, right? Um, you know, that's how our bodies stay healthy. So we reject all the foreign DNA and viruses and bacteria and everything, and we stay healthy. And 99% of the time, that's exactly what you want. And how do you have that shared set of values and principles and practices and, you know, people that are empowered to, you know, uh, veto a new candidate that you're hiring or veto a new idea that came up or, you know, in a comfortable, healthy tension in the, in the leadership team, you know, is always critical to that strong immune system. But occasionally you need to blunt the immune system and allow a new organ to tra- take hold. You know, that's what doctors do. They suppress your immune system so you can get an organ transplant, hopefully not often. But when you do, it can come in the form of a new senior hire or a new part of the product, you know, a new product that changes the way you organize your business. And to be able to suppress the immune system is hard. Um, and I remember, you know, one of the most critical hires that I ever made for Behance was our first real chief operating officer. And he came in with his own history and background and best practices. And, you know, and the first two or three weeks he was on the job, people were basically, you know, lining up to get into my office to tell me how this person wasn't going to work out because he wanted to call meetings this way and not that way. And because he was measuring things differently. And, you know, and I had to realize, you know, I had to say, listen, we have to give him three to six weeks to like, like really let's take his lead. 
and we can always reject, you know, and return to the previous version after that. But like, let's really try. And lo and behold, you know, he became the most critical hire we ever made. He transformed the business and um, and actually led Behance for many years, you know, after our acquisition. So I, I think that's that's the story, right? Is the immune system is an important thing so long as you know when to suppress it. Yes. Uh, you know, Scott, I love what you just said because, of course, well, we well know we bring senior executives in. We call them organ rejected if it doesn't work out. And yeah. we try to coach them to fit in with the team. <laughs> but how do you as a CEO feel when people are lining up to say, that guy's a problem. I don't like the way he's doing it. I don't like change. How do you as a CEO handle that? Because it's possible you made a mistake. And I've seen many CEOs who've made the wrong hire. But I've also seen CEOs not be able to withstand kind of the, you know, the, the rallying of the troops. So how did you think about that? Well, I think it would start by saying, you know, here's, here's where we're struggling as a company right now and where we need to change and scale. Let me, like, let me help you understand what's going on. We, we need help. We need someone with the qualifications, the background, who is empowered to do X, Y, and Z. You know, this is why we hired this person. The, you know, this person has a background in this, background in that. She got great reviews and references on this or whatever. You know, you help them understand the decision. In order for this person to be able to improve our organization, they're going to need to get a ramp up period of time where they're not being judged. You know, it's funny. We spend so much time hiring talent, but so little time grafting talent. And it's just as hard as hiring talent. I think it's you know, harder. Yeah, it's probably harder. So let's let's figure out like how do we how do we set this person up to succeed? Now, if we do everything we can to set them up for su- to succeed, and they don't, we will move on. We will make a change. But it never, you know, a critical hire never feels great at first because too much. You know, they're they're gonna they're they're so experienced. They're gonna come in and change things like right off the bat. And you know, again, like we. You know, we don't like change, as you said. And, you know, I always go back to Seth Godin's lizard brain, you know, the ancestral part of our brain that makes us cling to the familiarity and run away from all sorts of new newness. Um, familiarity will not get you to where you need to go. Um, it'll keep you where you are. So so I think that would that would be the logic, you know, path I would share with, you know, someone who came in and had that conversation with me. And I would make them feel the, oppor- the responsibility to help this person be set up to succeed. Mm-hmm. How about you yourself? Do you, how would you kind of check in with your gut and with this person to make sure that they're operating as expected and that there aren't, aren't actual red flags that the people are show are bringing you? Well, I think that first of all, the red flags I'd be looking for the early stages are values, a lack of curiosity, a lack of asking questions, you know, um, reminding people like they're here to learn for a period of time and to gain the credibility of their teams. And that's why I think an experienced person who's good at grafting themselves onto a team, you know, comes in and proclaims their ignorance, uh, you know, it really wants to ramp up and understand and learn and ask questions. And then once they start to formulate a strong opinion, you know, they start to check it with people and, you know, and then gu- get guidance on how to act upon it. So I think you want to look for red flags are people who are skipping those steps because then they won't succeed. Right. Right. I love that. That's a really well good. That's really well put. Now, Scott, tell us about your own leadership journey. I mean, you know, you started as a founder and you were bootstrapping for a while and you grew that company all the way and then you got acquired and now you're a senior executive in a big company. What are some of the w- things that come to mind when I ask you about kind of your transition points as a leader? What are some things to co- that come to mind that really stand out for you as your growth as a leader? Well, I think that, uh, you know, growth as a leader comes through strain and stress, at least for me. You know, I actually don't don't get much out of, uh, I mean, I get some confidence out of the things that work or an acquisition or whatever else. But the, the true growth is like, you know, the muscle tear, right? It's the stuff that doesn't go so well. I think having to kill products before and wondering why didn't I kill this two years ago, um, having to let people go and see the organization suddenly breathe again and asking myself, why didn't I make that decision faster? Uh, And, you know, and then trying to really always force myself to kind of understand why, you know? Um, Yeah. I think teams do have a tendency to kind of move on when something is 
killed and they don't really do the retrospective. And I, I love doing that retrospective. You know, I think it's, you know, that, that sort of insight is like truly like up leveling, I think in a career. So I would say it's, it's largely, it's largely those periods of strain and stress, you know, leading through a downturn in my, you know, in the startup, in my startup that I had and really, you know, getting pretty close to running out of, out of runway a few times. Yeah. And, and then, you know, seeing, seeing how the market reacts to things and you know, seeing what ends up making a dent and what doesn't. Those are also teaching moments. Yeah, for sure. When you do a retrospect for yourself, is there, do you have a formal process that you do when you sort of think about your own leadership? I don't. I, just, I think I just get super thoughtful and self-critical. And, you know, I say to myself, okay, no one's listening to my thoughts other than me right now. So I can, I can go all out. You know, I can like blame myself in any possible way. No one has to know. So it's a safe space in my brain. What did I do wrong? Like, why did I hesitate? Why was I scared? What was I worried about? Um, you know, what signals did I miss? And, you know, and really just, I think you have to be very critical in that, in that way. Just like a great product leader is never fully satisfied with you know, his or her product. You also should never be satisfied with how you conducted things. Like if you made a tough decision that should have been made earlier, call yourself out on it. You just robbed the team of another six months to a year of the sensation you're getting now by finally making that decision. Like understand why. Yeah. I had Paul English, the uh, co-founder and CTO of um, Kayak. And he said, it's like, as a leader, I make a contract with the employees that we're going to create a certain kind of place to work. And then if I keep an employee around for too long, I've kind of violated that contract. Mm -hmm. So I like the idea of the way you think about it. Have you personally picked up patterns in yourself as you've done those retros? Like, why do I, what am I scared of? Or what do I put off in terms of difficult, difficult um, decisions? Yeah, I think my general, you know, my general weaknesses track back to being um, a bit too optimistic in the power of a product or the power of people, you know, and I, I meet people and I want to see like what they could become. And I want to tell myself a narrative of what they're capable of and, oh, they could do this and they could do that. And in doing so, sometimes I actually forget to ask the right questions to validate whether or not this is the case. And so I catch myself, you know, I think that some of the mistakes in the past have made, you know, based on, based on, based on those sort of assumptions that should have been validated more rigorously. And, you know, and once you though, like face that, then you start to make little tricks and rules for yourself. Um, or you find other people who can compliment you, you know, and I, sometimes I go to someone else who I know is very different from me on this. And I say, okay, you, you need this person. Like, I want to hear what you have to think. Right. So getting it validated from somebody else. Are, can you share maybe one or two tricks or, or decision rules that you've created for yourself that help support you? I try to leave time to think about things, you know, in, in um, even when you're so short a meeting that you want to hire this person or you want to make this decision or you want to move this around. Like I really force myself to have some period of time to think on it because, again, I know I can get like high on the efficiency of making a decision. And I want to make sure that that doesn't influence my reasoning. Um, I would say that's one of them. I think the, uh, I think the other one is I, I will always like say to myself, like who else from the team could add value to this? Um, again, like I'm so into expedience that I like to just kind of push things forward and I will often be like stepping on toes if I do. So I want to like make sure I consider like, empathetically and I, who else's shoes could I be in where I would want to either have a say in this or be able to challenge me on this or be able to weigh in on this decision? Like, who are those people? Yeah, that's great. Now, Scott, you are one of those founders who, you know, you grew your company and then you got acquired. And then I, I have to say, like so many founders, they get acquired, they stay with the company for two years or four years or whatever it is, and then they leave. If I'm not mistaken, you left Adobe and then you came back. So now you're like a senior executive in a large company. Tell us about the difference between, you know, being the founder and being the leader of your growing startup and your actually your full grown startup as compared to being an executive at a large company. Like what are the kind of the pros and cons of each of that in terms of leadership? Yeah, well, I think that um, I mean, I would say the biggest difference is, again, that degree of control you can have over the it's a closed system versus an open system. And I, you know, I miss the sensation of a closed system where I can just everything from the office and the space to the 
policies to the slide deck and the style of the slide deck to the people we're hiring to the food that's served. Like I can have my touch on everything and really like have a closed system experience that is very special. You know, there's something very special about that. When you get to a huge company, a lot of this is out of your control. I mean, you might get one email saying, hey, what do you think about this office renovation? And then like there's a whole team that's staffed on that. And, you know, they can't involve you in those meetings because you have a million other meetings to be in. And and so you have to, it's an exercise in actually letting go of a lot of things and really forcing yourself to focus on the few things that you can do that move the needle the most. And, uh, you know, I think it's a very healthy forcing function that I've had to go through. It's, teach, it's taught me quite a bit about how I can add the most value. But still, you know, you, you sometimes look at something that happened, you're like, oh, how did that get out of my, com- my hands? Like, that's not the way I would have wanted that to be. And so there's a lot of that compromise. And, and maybe that's why the bigger the company, the more inconsistencies there are across the customer experience and the brand. And it's just, you know, you can't have one person at the center of all of it. So, um, so I think that's, that's like the daily drama. Yeah. The daily drama of, of, I think also being in meetings and working cross-functionally. I mean, you must have to really learn how to, you know, navigate and deal with your peers cross-functionally in a way that you just, just wasn't part of your ecosystem at the startup. I think that's right. But also, you know, the tendency as an entrepreneur to resist the status quo and change new processes and ways of doing things. I mean, those are all, those all pay a premium in a big company. And so those of you that are entrepreneurs listening that have the tenacity to like make that happen in a bigger company against the grain. It's really exciting. Yeah. Yep. Totally. Now what I appreciate about you and certainly in your book and on podcasts I've heard um, about you is that you're so honest about what it's like to be an entrepreneur and the ups and downs and the brain space it takes. And I guess I would love to hear maybe if you could just share one or two of your like most nerve wracking moments as a founder maybe to give hope to other founders who are going through massively nerve wracking times, nerve wracking things, especially in this time with the economy. There are many nerve wracking moments because, you know, a startup is, is a very, um, is, it's an, it's always in a delicate balance. You know, you're always, you're, you're running more on hope than facts. Um, you're working amidst complete anonymity oftentimes ambiguity, uncertainty, and anxiety, right? And you really just don't see an end in sight. Um, you tell yourself this great narrative, and then you you know, you know walk out, out the street into the corner, and you realize that the guy selling fruit on the corner has a better business than you do. Um, and you know it's sort of humbling to realize, oh, wait, like I'm losing money still. This is not viable, and our default is dead. And um, so those are, you know, the, that's all, those are all very, you know, tricky, tricky things to, stay excited about. Um, I always like to say that leading a startup team is like driving a car cross country with the windows blacked out in the back seat and everyone in your team in the back seat. And so they're all wondering like, where the heck are we? Like, why is our car not moving? Like why are, and to, and what you can do as a leader to not make them drive themselves crazy is to narrate the journey for the people that are in the back seat that can't see right? So we're crossing state lines. Oh, we're in some traffic now, but I see it opening up. You know, you, you, as you tell the narration and you merchandise the progress that you're making to the people that are making it, um, you can actually keep people engaged, you know, through this very, you know, volatile period uh, that I like to call the messy middle. And I think without, you know, without that, it's really hard. And that's why, you know, attrition is really bad in the startup world. And people are always, attracted by headlines that suggest that it's better somewhere else than it is where you are. Well, my story is that I think the competitive advantage of great startups is sticking together long enough to figure it out. Yes. I mean, that's so wise. Sticking together long enough to figure it out and being able to withstand all that, all the ups and downs. And something you just said, you know, I really loved your book, The Messy Middle. And what I I took away so many things from it, but the, the crowning thing I took away was this idea of merchandising progress. I loved how you put that. Could you talk more about why that's so important and why also, I, I know you talk a lot about progress and the motivation of progress. Could you talk more about that? Yeah, sure. So when I was getting my MBA, I um, studied under a woman named Teresa Mabale at Harvard Business School, who did a lot of research on motivation and creativity and enterprise. And 
she did this big journaling study and you know long story short is the realization was that people felt most motivated um, and made more progress when they felt they had made progress and so there was a bit of a chicken and egg thing associated with progress that i found very fascinating um my second point would be that the there's a you know hundred billion dollar plus industry called advertising that all just makes stuff that merchandises actions to us right and so much of our consumer behavior is determined by the ads we see the the billboards etc that get us to do things and um and so i think you kind of have to use those same tricks and tools of merchandising to help people understand and see the progress that they are making so you know i would like to advertise to my team the progress that we are making using the same tricks of advertising like clever pithy stories and, and and headlines and beautiful graphics and you know very um very convincing narratives so that people can see like we are making progress even though it doesn't feel like we are and no one knows who we are yet and we're not making any money we are actually are progressing and when you leave that you feel motivated to make more progress and i think that's the responsibility of the leader Yes. How would you say the leader should motivate him or herself and merchandise progress to him or herself? Yeah, I, I you know I um, for me it's writing. You know, I like to I like to write letters to my teams. Um, I like to uh, explain like and remind myself as well as them like why we're here, like what we're doing, and why this is important work, and um, and the opportunity that's in our hands. You know, to to seize. And, you know, writing, writing that out is a part of my cathartic processing and, you know, and churning through, you know, what our next steps are, you know, as a team. So I think writing, I think writing is important. And I also think, uh, you know, setting, setting annual goals for yourself is important as well. You know, I used to make a list of kind of the few things that I just wanted to end this year saying I had done. Um, you know, some of those were things for the team and our culture. Some of them were key hires or and, other, and others were just product milestones I wanted to have us achieve. And it's really fun when you look back the year, you know, a year from then and realize, wow, like we did most of these. Yes. Setting goals and achieving them. To your point about progress, there's like nothing yeah. like that. Yeah. You know, I had Rahul Vora, um, the, the founder and CEO of Superhuman on the podcast, and he told me that when he pitched VCs, you know, they would go for funding and he would pitch VCs or he would just like have conversations with them. It was almost like he got re-energized. So he felt like every six weeks he has to re-pitch himself to remind, to keep himself, you know, yeah. up, to, up to date on motivation. I think that's, I think that's a great point. I mean, listen, you're always selling in this job. Yes. Um, you're selling employees, you're selling investors, you're obviously selling customers, uh, and, you know, and you're selling to employees that you currently have to retain them. How do you manage right now your own personal and professional development? Like, and how has that changed over the years? Because it seems like you're someone very interested in self-growth. In terms of self-development, you know, there, there are a number of people that become mentors of mine that I try to check in with, you know, once a year, plus any time a major decision, you know, is on my mind. And, um, you know, and those are, those are, those people play a key role for me in my life. There are also key people on my team that I, you know, really deeply trust that I want to run certain things by and ask for feedback. Um, and oftentimes when I do a big all hands or whatever, I will usually ask a few colleagues, you know, what, what, what could I have done better? Like what didn't come across? Well, I have a wonderful chief of staff, a woman named Emmy who will always tell me, you know, you spoke too fast or this part didn't really click with people or whatever. And I think that's invaluable feedback for me. By the way, when you ask people for feedback, then they feel compelled to ask you for feedback. And that's an opportunity for you to give them feedback. So it's a great, uh, it's a great tool to use, you know, with your team. That is so true. How do you as the leader and how do you, how, how did you as the founder CEO and now how do you as a leader really get people to tell you the truth? Because it sounds like you have some trusted relationships where you've built up that context, but you need a lot of people telling you the truth. How do you think about that? Yeah, and I think I, I I would say that my biggest struggle is with people who I don't think tell me the truth, um, and usually it's because they don't want to disappoint me. Um, but it's you know it, it ends up backfiring. So uh, I think it's important to make sure that there's a safe space um, to build relationships, and 
you know, I, I think I can sometimes cut steps there because I just want to kind of get into it and get things done. Again, I, I'm always optimizing for efficiency and you can't, you know, sometimes you just can't fortify a relationship super quickly over Zoom. You know, you just have to spend time with people. So I, um, you know, recognizing where you, where and when, where you can and can't take shortcuts, I would say is, uh, is critical for that. Yeah. You talked about mentors. Can you tell us how you've kind of gotten your mentors and, and specifically what kinds of things they help you with? And you can feel free to mention names if you would like, but you don't have to. Yeah. No, I mean, I have um, my mentors, you know, I have one person who's just a really legendary product leader and builder um, who has always sort of, you know, whenever I say things to him, he knows what I'm just saying to convince myself of something versus what I really mean. And, and he has the right questions to ask. You know, I have a couple other mentors that are a bit, a bit of like Yoda characters. They're, um, you know, incredible one's an incredible designer and one is a, you know, a, a very a well-known author who in the business world who just you know um i have a pilgrimage where i visit him once a year and you know he uh he challenges me on some of the decisions i have made and i remember a couple of years ago he said promise me that next year you'll be on planes 50 percent less um and i thought that's impossible absolutely impossible and then COVID happened so i, I, I <laughs> so. i'm sure he did not cause COVID. Yeah. But, uh, no, I, I have to, I have to adhere to that now that the world is opening back up, but you know, these are people who I really respect and who know me, um, pretty well. And, you know, I, I really value their honesty. I guess a, one common trait across all of them is they're just completely candid and will tell me exactly what they think. So I have to assume I'm positive actually that you're now a mentor for other founders and you're also a seed investor And I'm just curious, how has mentoring other, you know, up and coming founders and others, how has that made you think think differently about leadership or how has that changed your own leadership style, if at all? Well, it's really rewarding to go through another person's journey, you know, in an intimate way with them. It's a lot of fun, as you know, as a coach, you know, it's really amazing to sometimes be in that room and, and, uh, you know, learn from their experience. It you know, makes me realize a lot of the things I've learned and how they can be useful. Um, and, uh, and I just get a real great sensation from it. I feel like I would also like being a teacher someday, maybe, you know, just that feeling of helping people get to something on their own and then they synthesize it and they realize, Oh, like they realize what they need to do. And just to play like a small role in that is really rewarding. Um, I also learn a lot because I will say things you know, in our conversations that will then make me realize the clarity of something that, that I had never framed that way that I then use with my teams, you know? Um, so that happens all the time. And I think it's probably just having thought partners and other, other people's problems that you can help reconcile. And then you suddenly get an insight into your own problem. Yeah, that is so true. Is there a common theme? Um, if you think about the CEOs and the founders that you mentor, you advise, are there some common themes that come up that you sort of see all the time? How to hire, you know, how to make sure you have the right hire. How do you change org design, you know, is one that comes up constantly. Is how should I structure this? And the, the tricky part about that is that it's really dependent upon the people and the nature of the business and the culture and the, the, the strengths or weaknesses of the founder. I mean, there's, you know, a lot of nuances. So anyone that tells you that Ching should be either functional or horizontal or, you know, there's there's no rules that you should listen to, um, you know, and anyone who tells you otherwise is wrong. You know, so it's really a conversation about org design. I would say also getting to product market fit is always like a common theme. You know, should I quit or should I stick with it is a common theme that I go through with a lot of founders, you know, in, in the messy middle. You know, and then I would also say um, difficult choices, you know, being in the room with a term sheet for an acquisition and should I do this? Should I not do this? You know, these are all the types of conversations that, uh, you know, that, that, that I get to have. It's, it's in there, you know, I learned from each one. Yes. You know, that you've, you've articulated so many things that like literally you can't answer for them as in that's a hard, right. hard thing to know. And yeah. it's more of a weighing pros and cons. Are there frameworks or questions that you find helpful to get them to ask themselves or that you ask them that help elucidate some of these topics? 
Yeah, I think I have a framework for all of them, uh, different ones, you know, different framework for each of them. You know, for example, on the um, on the M&A front, it's like really around, it's really around the what's best for the customers, what's best for your team, and then the financial outcome with an apples to apples for increased dilution and market risk in the future with future fundraising versus now. And I always try to, that last one is a math exercise. I try to bring them through. And the, the former two are more around how, um, you know, how they should think about what's best for the customers and what's best for their team. And so that's, you know, that's, for example, a framework, you know, as it relates to acquisitions. And um, yeah, I think there's always, there's, there's a many frameworks I'll pull into play. And as you're right, you're right. I don't ever say, I actually try not to say what I think they should do um, because I don't know, but I do try to pose the frameworks and the questions and, you know, start to get a sense of where they believe they should do. Yes. If you think about someone coming to you and say, oh, it's not working. Should we quit or should we keep going and try something different? How, what kind of frameworks or questions do you have yeah. for that question? Yeah. The key framework for that is around um, measurement of conviction. And, you know, I sort of ask them at the beginning when you started this, before you knew anything, did you have a lot of conviction that X needed to exist? And the answer is always yes, right? It's like, yes, you know, we were so certain. And then the question is, okay, regardless of whether you found product market fit or not, let's put that to a side for a minute, because you can keep trying and you can get it the fourth time, the fifth time, or the seventh time. Like, look, that doesn't really matter. What It's painful, but it doesn't really matter. What matters is, as you're learning with customers, as you're learning based on what you're showing people and the conversations you're having that you didn't have when you started this journey, have you gained more or less conviction? And they think about that. And, you know, some are like more conviction. Like, I mean, I know this needs to exist and there's definitely willingness to pay. And and then I'm like, okay, this is par for the course. You're in the messy middle. No problem. Like just, you have, we have to talk about hacks to keep your team engaged and endure the lows and optimize the highs and, you know, stay forward, five more iterations ahead, stick with it. If the answer is, honestly, like conviction is wavering because we're hearing this, but then we validated it and it's actually this and we tried this and people didn't even agree with us. And, you know, then I have a different conversation. And then I say to them, there's no pride in trying to figure this out. Like, if you're if you've lost conviction from the moment when you had no knowledge, you know, now with all the knowledge you have, try something different. Like life is short. There's no shame in quitting. In fact, you're going to leverage what you learned and you'll either pivot or do something completely different. That's fine. Like, let's have an honest conversation about where your conviction level is based on all you've learned. Yes. And I think it is so hard. I think actually you're doing a lot of service for folks because they need permission sometimes to give up if they're too close yeah. to it. And it's not about giving up and quitting because the going gets hard. It's about, to your point, the level of conviction has something changed, either in Correct. your insight about it or also your own attitude about it. Yeah. In the conviction piece, you'd be surprised how many people keep working at something, even though they've lost conviction based on what they've learned. And I, I, that never has worked in my experience. Right. Totally. Now, Scott, you're someone who has a fantastic network. I guess I would ask you, how do you think about, you know, continuing to invest in your network and build your network? And what benefits have you gotten out of having a great network? Well, you know, I think that my, my whole view on network and networking is that sharing is the new networking. You know, and you used to go to cocktail parties and give out business cards and try to connect with people on LinkedIn. You know, I think I think now the best form of networking is sharing ideas. Um, I've always been very liberal with ideas. You know, I've always been very responsive to direct messages and emails and, you know, trying to make everything like kind of publicly available because then you get, you become known for the things that you've created and the, or the knowledge you have to share or the interesting questions you have to ask. And, you know, those are all unifying principles. Those bring people together and uh, make people, you know, feel and, you know, a sense of value from you that they wanted to then return. So there are a lot of people that are in my network that I've even never, never even met physically. They're just people that I have been following or, and they've been following me and my ideas for years. And we rally and, you know, and, 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 and riff off each other, you know, on Twitter or wherever. And, you know, and, 
when eight years later, I have some question and that person works at that company and I DM them and say, hey, can you help me with this? We feel like we're like best buds. You know, it's we've gone through so much together, even though we never actually met. So, uh, you know, I, I think that sharing is the new networking. And, and that's why I advise people to get active, you know, sharing your ideas on a medium or publishing or, you know, um, posting on social, you know, to people in your industry and following them and, you know, agreeing or disagreeing with their ideas and engaging them. Like, this is how it happens. I love that. Sharing is the new networking. I love that so much. I'm going to put on a t-shirt. I will credit you. And also, um, you know, as a coach, I'm constantly saying to people, build your brand, but it's not superficial. Build your brand. It's really about figure out what you think by writing about it, by exposing it to feedback of others and by interacting in the world of ideas with people. And it both helps you sharpen your own thinking. It also helps you connect with folks yeah. you don't even know around and you. By the way, one of the most valuable things I do every year from a networking perspective is I take a day, you know, at the end of December and I synthesize kind of seven to 10 outlooks for the future, things that I am most fascinated by that I think are going to happen, you know, in the near, in the, sh- in the near future. Um, and it's a way of me synthesizing all the trends that I've seen, the things that I, and it's a great exercise for myself as a technologist. And every time I publish this, you know, tons of people reach out, you know, this is the business I'm building that's doing this, or you should meet so-and-so, or you should meet so-and-so, or, you know, it's just a, it's an amazing like source. And, you know, and I, I wonder, like, everyone should publish the 10 things that they think should happen in the near future. Everyone should do that. Why not? You know, and people might ignore it for a few years as they did mine originally, and then eventually they'll pay attention. And that's a, it's a great exercise. I love it. That's a great exercise. Okay, we should all do that in December. Um, Scott, just a couple more questions. What do you wish you had known earlier on your journey? You know, I, I think that one of the things you have to figure out as you're building a team is the balance between initiative and experience. You know, and I think you want to early days, you want to hire more for initiative than experience because you're in an environment where everyone's going to have to work together to figure it out together. And there's something really wonderful about that. If you hire too experienced of a person too early that doesn't have initiative to like change and navigate, they won't survive the sprints. They won't survive the, 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 the pivots and the multiple tries to product market fit because they're experts. And so they'll want to move on somewhere to somewhere where they get it already. So I think that hiring for initiative rather than experience but then you can make the inverse problem later on. You know, when you're hiring to manage a big product and team, hiring for initiative is not enough. Um, you need to hire experienced people who've seen this 10 times before who can help the team, you know, step around disasters and, and that sort of thing. So I think that's one thing I have learned the hard way that I wish I had known earlier on. Um, and, uh, you know, and then again, I would say that a labor of love always pays off, just not how you'd expect. I think I've seen that time and time again in my career as well. I love that. It's so well said. So last question, what advice do you have for other founders as they embark on their journey to grow into leaders? Well, I I would simply advise people as they're choosing opportunities or job opportunities and that sort of thing to just ensure that they're getting an incremental step closer to what they're genuine and genuinely interested in. And, um, you know, it, we're tempted sometimes to take a job because it pays a little more or, you know, or, or because it's at a sexy company name or whatever, when in fact, what we should be doing is we should, we should be trying to work with people that we really respect and want to learn from. And we should be trying to get incrementally closer to what's genuinely interesting to us. Uh, the people that I know who've had the luxury to take a year or two to just be, as my friend, uh, Dennis Crowley recently said, like a CEO of your own passion, um, they end up creating great things, you know, taking that time. Um, I think allowing yourself to be a tinker and explore your interests and engage with them a little bit, if you have the luxury to do so and can, you know, put enough food on the table to, to survive that period. I think it's a really helpful thing to be able to do as well. I love it. I love it. CEO of your own passion. Thank you, Scott. Thank you for your generosity and sharing, uh, what you had to say today. And I know people are really going to benefit from it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to From Startup to Grown Up. If you like what you heard, 
give it a review on Apple Podcasts so other people can find it. And if you know of a founder or someone else who is meant to be on this podcast, drop me a line through my website, alyssacone.com.